Hey guys, what's up? It's Coach Carol. Welcome to another episode here in the Sales Factory. I got my man, Alex Shattuck. Shatty boy. I got him here in the podcast studio, the virtual studio, because you know everything's over Zoom nowadays. But I'm super excited to have this guy. You all might know him from the five guys. No, not the burger insurance, but they were on tour for a while. That's how I know the guy. And I said, man, come hang out with me in the sales factory. Let's put these people on game. So you guys get your notepads ready. Turn the headphones up. Alex Shattuck, welcome to the sales factory, my man. How you doing today, baby? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Thanks for thanks for having me. I love that you gave me a nickname. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was playing with that beforehand, you know, with this, these these uh, Zenheiser microphones. I'm like, shut it, shut it, shut it, shut it. It just it sounds nice and in, in, in fresh. So I don't know, man. I it yeah. just I just rolled I've been with it. So. Way worse. So I appreciate that. That's, that's awesome. Love it, man. If you guys don't know Al, uh, as a lot of people refer to him as Alex Al, he's uh, he's a captive agent for Big Red. He's got three offices. Um, he is. A a, also, just a, an entrepreneur like myself. He's got a recruiting business called Autopilot Recruiting. It's got a couple uh, books behind it. You, you got some books you read as well. Like this dude's yep. just a straight hustler. But you know that's the mo. Coach Carroll bringing you guys the best of the best in the sales factory. And so uh, we'll talk a little bit today about recruiting. We'll talk about running multiple offices. We'll talk about his entrepreneur journey. He's also I uh, found out a father of four. So he was over here, you know, giving me the pep talk of like you can do it, man. Two's not too bad. You know, you know, it's funny, Alex, we were talking about that off camera. I had a, a one of my buddies down at the Pendennis Club. He told me, he said, man, having one kid's not parenting. That's two on one defense. He said two kids ain't even really parenting. That's man coverage. When you got to start going two, three zone or two, four zone, now you're parenting. And I think that's what you were alluding to before we hopped on here. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it definitely becomes a little more challenging as you add bodies, but I won't take anything away from from having one kid either. It's kind of like, you know, you mentioned multiple offices. If you have one business, one agency that you got, you got a lot on your plate. So mm. no, I... I wouldn't take anything away from from you having one at this point. <laughs> nah, man, we love it. It's been it's been such awesome. Uh, I know the listeners are probably tired of hearing me talk about it, but I can't help it, man. I'm like a proud dad now, so uh, it's it's been fun. But man, I'm excited to have you today uh, for the limited time that I got you. I know you got a ton of knowledge inside that dome of yours. I've seen you speak. Uh, you're a great presenter. You give really good information, and you're also a veteran as well, right? Yes, yeah, yes, man. Marine Corps. Yeah, man. Iraq. All right. Appreciate your service. Uh, my wife, Tori, as the listeners know, she did six years in the Air Force. So um, my dad was in the Army. So we definitely appreciate your military service, man. And I love I love seeing when uh, heroes come back home and uh, start businesses, man, because it's like, you know, I, I told a guy one time I went to high school with he he. He was in uh, Afghanistan. He came home. I said, hey, man, I appreciate everything you do. Like, you let me do what I'm doing. He's like, what are you talking about, man? I'm like, dude, that's what fighting for the freedom is. Freedom of free enterprise. Like, that's what makes America great, man. The power of free enterprise. Jim Rohn probably taught that better than anybody. Um, and so uh, I'm excited to hop in this thing, man. We'll, we'll, let's let's back up. Give everybody, since this is your first time, we won't have to do this every time you come in the sales factory, but the first time I always like to give them a little bit of background. So kind of, kind of give us an insight of, you know, who Alex is for people that don't know who – don't know you or is this her first time hearing from you or meeting you yeah man all right let's see how far back do i go um <laughs> you already mentioned the four kids also married married with four kids uh multiple businesses multiple agencies um rewind time a little bit i, I started working for an insurance agent oh shoot back in 2009 and so i started in the industry working for an agent and selling insurance right just like a lot of us and eventually took over an agency and then went scratch with my second location wow. and then took over the third, um, a little over a year ago. And yeah, autopilot recruiting was something that had been created, um, kind of on accident. I was always kind of, uh, I guess called on to, to chat with agents about recruiting and, and what I do and, and how I've been able to staff my agencies and grow it and all that fun stuff. And so I started speaking on the topic of recruiting way back when and started traveling and doing that thing. And I still do. But I, I kept getting feedback from from agents saying, hey, man, I'd, I'd rather just pay somebody to do it. I love what you're saying, but I'd, I'd rather just pay somebody. Do you have anything to refer us to? And there wasn't really anything that I could point to that was a continuous approach to recruiting. A lot of, uh, you know, one time pay this, get that um, businesses, and that's fine. There's a place for that in the industry. But I really believe truly that it has to be continuous, it has to be every single day, it has to be forever. 
And so I decided to try to create it. And it went from, you know, one agent to, to two and then three. And then now we're, we're pushing 1800. Holy smokes. And also, yeah. And then <laughs> also a, a whole slew of businesses outside the insurance industry too. And so wow. we, we do it for, um, some big businesses, a lot of small businesses primarily, but all types of industries. And so it's, ha- it's helping thousands, you know, and business owners helping thousands find employment. And, um, and I'm also employing, you know, 150, uh, on that team. Wow. And, and so it, it's, it's really, the impact is, is, is tremendous with how many people it helps. And That's I'm having wild, a lot of fun man. with it too. And, and of course, it's it's not a nonprofit organization, so I make a few bucks also, and that's an added bonus. <laughs> free, God bless free enterprise, my man. Uh, yeah. the, so the the uh, the eighteen hundred you say you're outside of industries. We got listen. So just so you know, man, the sales factory listeners that are tuned in right now, dude, this could be a thirteen year old kid that just bought his first lawnmower and is, and is like, Sweet. you know, I like Coach Carroll, so I'm gonna go learn some shit and try to make some money. Or I mean, it could be a dude that's running a mega agency or anywhere in between, right? I always say the sales factory is entrepreneur and sales focus for blue collar, white collar, no collar. You know, we're, we're, I'm from Kentucky, oh, yeah. bro. I'm not even wearing shoes right now. No, I'm just joking. But, uh, so, so maybe, maybe somebody could reach out to you guys then, right? Even if they're not in the insurance space, you might, uh, we're not saying that oh, you yeah. could uh, offer their vertical, but they, that it could be an option if they're having a hard time recruiting, right? Absolutely. Uh, it's worth a conversation. So cool, recruiting.com. but Hey, you mentioned a 13 year old, my first business, uh, to go back in time. I was in sixth grades. So I was 12. And I, I started a lawn care business. When I was 12 and it, it was <laughs> I called it AJS mowing. My initials AJS mowing. That's as, as creative as I could get. But um, <laughs> and, and when I say business, I use that term loosely. I mowed some lawns and I charged some money. Yeah, and so I'll count it. Yeah, uh, I made some flyers. You know, I went around like door to door, putting out flyers and just um, I literally like would drive like this little mower around town to different places that would hire me or push the mower down the road and you know whatever. So. Uh, that's funny you said that. That's I, I had crazy, about that man. Until now. You, you know what's nuts is like Nick Saka is a big Allstate agent out in Vegas. He had a lawn, a lawn and landscape. Business. Like I mean, I've, the the number of people that I've interviewed that have had lawn and landscape businesses early on in their career, I think it just it teaches you entrepreneurship. You know what I mean? You had to make a flyer. That's some marketing. You had to talk to somebody. That's some sales. You had to back in fulfill the orders. Right? It's operations. Like it's such a good way for people to learn entrepreneurship. Mm-hmm. And I and I always I've said this in an interview before that I think entrepreneurship is kind of like the key to freedom. And I know not not everyone is going to be able to unlock that door because it's tough, dude. Like you're talking about running an, an off, you know, your 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 side hustle. I wouldn't call it a side hustle. 150 fucking people, right? But it's like you know, it's not your it's not your insurance business that which is like was your main focus. But like 150 people are like not everybody is cut out to be able to be a leader at that capacity. And I understand that. That's not lost on me. And and I always say entrepreneurship is kind of like fireworks. It should be given with a word of caution because uh, you can blow your hand off, right? You can lose your life you can lose your livelihood people lose their houses all the time trying to start a business but if entrepreneurship is the key to freedom dude how crazy to live your entire life and never try it you know that's why I'm like it's not for everybody but I think everybody should try it that's my little stick on entrepreneurship but um what what happened after Al, Al's made his uh, lawn care business debut uh you know obviously you guys went you, you got married how long how long have you and your wife been married oh pop man, quiz <laughs> We got married young, um, 18, 17 years, something like that. Okay. And, uh, yeah, we got married. I was 21 and we both were 21. Wow. Um, you know, in the Marines and stuff that it, it, you see that a lot. And, uh, yeah. for us, fortunately, you know, we're, we're still, still going for it. Right? That's you know, good, so, man. Uh, a lot of times when you get married young like that, it doesn't always work out. We've, uh, we, we've, we've made it work and it, it's been, it's been good. So that's cool. Um, man. Kids are healthy and everything. So no complaints, but, uh, yeah, so pushing a couple of decades. That's cool, man. Makes me Talk, feel older than I am. If you guys are listening to the audio-only version uh, on the podcast, make sure you hit the subscribe and leave us a review, by the way. But uh, co- he's got this banner up behind him that says Complacency Kills. Looks like maybe you got a hat on that says Complacency Kills yeah. as well, right? You're rock, uh, you rocking the merch, man. Is that a little Kurt, Kurt Cobain there around the corner, too, I think, uh, looks like maybe. Is that who's that? Yeah. That? Okay. Yeah, I wish you could see the rest of my office here at home. I have a lot of... <laughs> interesting things on my walls but um yeah i'm a big you know kurt guy um the the complacency kills talk to me about that uh, logo there's a story there i don't know if if you care to to hear it i would i would love to hear it man um, especially because it's a skull and crossbones so it's i mean i don't think this is gonna be like you were walking through the uh, rose garden picking flowers one day and came up with this (laughs) yeah no i mean it it takes it it goes it starts back in, in fallujah iraq you know and uh 
I mean, I haven't told the story in a little while, but I think I could okay. probably still spit it out. And um, essentially, the, you know, Fallujah, as you probably remember, uh, wasn't exactly the place that you would want your loved ones to end up at. You know, if you had loved ones in the military at that time, it's kind of one of those cities that um, you wouldn't want to see him or her in. And this is 2006, you know, when I arrived. And um, yeah, I mean, it was just every everywhere you went. You know, we, we lived in, in, in the city uh, and then we lived south, just, just the, the south end of the city. And where we were every time, every single time we stepped out of the, the building that we occupied, we couldn't leave the, the structure that we were living in without having our, our full flak jacket on, Kevlar helmet on, our magazine inserted in the M16 and round in the chamber, just to step outside into like the, where you would use like the portage on, if you will, we call it a portage shitter. I don't know if you can say portage shitter. <laughs> yeah, dude, it's, it's but, a sales uh, factory podcast. So, we're yeah, good. I mean, so if you were out there at all doing anything, even where you're supposed to be somewhat safe, you were all geared up, flak jacket, wow. all that. Um, and that was before you even stepped outside the wire, outside of like the, the big, the walls that you're within to go on patrol. And then from there, it's just like, you know, every step, every turn, you know, we knew at that time could potentially be our last, the, the IED threat, which are roadside bombs were, were, that was real. That was out there. Um, small arms fire, sniper fire to, you know, in addition to just random small arms fire mortars were a thing. Um, you have kids that would throw grenades in Fallujah. That was a thing. Jeez. RPGs. Like there was just threats around every corner and going back to the that logo you're looking at in my hat and, and the book and the the flag complacency kills um that came from a different base so we would sometimes leave the city of fallujah to get resupplied we take a convoy out of the city uh to the outskirts to a much bigger base um there's camp baharia camp fallujah outside of the city and those were really big bases and so when you would cross over those those tall walls with armed guards um, letting you in, you could then at that point, unload your weapon, take off your flak jacket, take off your, your Kevlar helmet and just like breathe. For take a, a deep few breath. Minutes, right? You can kind of <laughs> relax a little bit. And they had a chow hall so you could get some real food. They had uh, working phones and working internet. So you could go and maybe make a phone call home or check your email to see what was up back home. And it, at some points it was, you know, first time in, in not just days, but weeks that we could pull that off. Wow. Uh, but, but again, it was a very short lived little mission. We'd get what we had to get, maybe eat something, maybe call home, whatever. And then we would gear back up and load up in the Humvees and start making that trip back to the exit. And the last image that we would see as we got to those walls with the tall, tall walls, armed guards was a very comparable image to what you're looking at, which was a big skull and crossbones and the words complacency kills. And it was just that final reminder to all of us that once you, once you cross back over, you know, you're not, in that safe space where you could let your guard down and breathe a little bit. It's game on your head's on a swivel. You can't take anything lightly. And it's, it's one of those worlds where if, if you do, you know, you don't have your a game on that day. It could be very devastating for those around you and yourself, wow. obviously too. So, um, they just that final reminder and, uh, the complacency kills theme, you know, I kind of forgot about it when I got home and some years went by and, and this is, you know, so now you're looking at, you know, 2007, eight, nine, um, I started to get a little complacent back here at home and I don't know at what point exactly, but there was some point where I, I, I thought about that image and those, those words complacency kills. And I started thinking about the experiences that I had that we all went through and, and what we've accomplished. And, um, man, I realized I wasn't really applying any of that stuff here at home. Like anything mm. that was going to help myself, help my family, help my future. And, um, if anything, those experiences were probably hindering my ability to be successful here at home as I struggled in a lot of areas and um, I started to, to take the approach of applying that, that mindset of complacency kills here at home. And what I found in the years following was, was the simple truth that complacency complacency doesn't just kill in the war zone. Complacency kills here at home too, mm. right? It, it kills our finances. Ooh. It kills our health. It kills Take our relationships. What's that? I sound, I don't know if you can hear my sound effects. I got a little cash register, oh. and so anytime uh, anytime knowledge gets dropped, bro, I say take that one to the bank. That one right there, oh. it'll kill you in the war zone, but it'll kill you at home too. That oh, is yeah, your health, ooh. businesses, relationships, you <laughs> name it, finances. Um, and so again, once I started to kind of take that approach here at home, I noticed things started to get a little better here at home. Surprise, surprise. surprise and so surprise. I, uh, you know, my first book I wrote, I, I named Complacency Kills with that theme in mind. And I go deeper into that concept, and and um, wow. that 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 book is for all all small businesses. But um, where yeah, where I, can I we find that book, Al? 
Is that online? Um, Some is that on Amazon or is it still for sale? That one might not be on Amazon at the moment. My recruiting book is, but where you can find both is autopilotrecruiting.com. So um, they have the books. They actually have the swag too. autopilotrecruiting.com. There's a swag. There's a, there's a shop there where if you ever wanted to get a hat or a shirt or whatever, I, um, I dig it. You know, I like skills. I actually, I don't know if you can see, I actually have it a tattoo version, you know, on the back of my left arm. I I have a handful of different tattoos, but that's one of them. Um, (laughs) It's funny, I uh, when I went to my, my tattoo guy, I had this vision for it, and I, I wanted it, like, right, like, on, like, my, my main part of my arm that's more visible. Uh-huh. And he's, uh, and he's, he's a cool dude, and his name's Stu, and he's, he's in Lansing area up here in Michigan, and, and he's, he's kind of, like, talking through this idea, and it says, like, complacency kills, and it's kind of intertwined into a, a cool, scary skull, like, even much, much more detail than what you're looking at mm-hmm. behind me. And where I, I, where I wanted it, he's like, hey, man, just so you know, you're going to be like trying to sell insurance and shit. And the customer, all they're going to see is the word <laughs> kills popping out of the bottom of your arm. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So we put it on the back. So when you do see the word kills popping out in the skull, like, it, you know, at least you have a chance to. It's as you're walking out the door and you already sold the policy. So it doesn't yeah, matter, yeah, right? So I'm walking out, they see it. Like, Who what the hell is this guy's problem? But um, yeah, I figured maybe having kills in front of all my, my customers and prospects in the future could be a problem. So. Dude, that is Whatever. an awesome story. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, uh, that's, I've got buddies that have been over there and, you know, um, you guys saw some terrible, terrible shit, man. Like you said, kids throwing hand grenades. Like it's, it's hard to even fathom, uh, what, what some of those guys went through and, and the people that paid the ultimate sacrifice. So again, appreciate your service, man. Appreciate you sharing that story. And I think it is a wake up call, right? It's like, that's why I don't buy into the whole, the whole, like, you know, kumbaya, let's hold hands together. Like I'm a super competitive person because like mm-hmm. I played football and like after football, like, I mean, it's no, obviously I'm not trying to make any comparison before the people hop in my fucking comments and like blow me up on this. I'm not making mm-hmm. any comparisons to like, oh, me playing football was like Al like kicking indoors in Fallujah. No, I understand. This is completely different. What I'm saying is, is that when you have that competitiveness, once you get taken to a heightened level like that, where you got to strap in and understand complacency kills, it's like, you almost like a piece of you has to die inside for you just to be this like, oh, kumbaya, everything's great. Like, no, like, if you're a high-intensity person, man, like, don't apologize for that shit. Like, Al's rocking it, bro, rocking it on his skin, rocking it on his hat, rocking it on the banner in the background. Like, you know, be locked in. And I think, honestly, Al, I'd love your opinion on this, of the world that we live in today is very much this like, well, just, you know, sit down and just relax and chill. And I think, like, the... The chill is the problem. I think maybe we've got a little too much chill, and like people are going broke and like just sitting and watching their lives go by, versus like actually taking responsibility for their actions and their decisions and doing something with their life. Would love your take on that, man. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I don't disagree at all. Um, you know, the way I've raised my kids, I think I take a little different approach than than most parents, just because I. I, I I am cut from that cloth. I, I feel there's there's fewer and fewer people cut from that cloth every day, and that's that's a real problem, and it will be a bigger problem, I, I think, long term. I and I don't mind the football comparison at all. I, in fact, I think you know. Again, I, I also will say that there's a clear difference between the two. However, um, I've spoken to like youth football teams, high school level football teams, uh, on this theme of complacency kills because so much is applicable, you know, in sports, in life, on the football field. And so the message is something that you can connect those two. Uh, and I, I do believe like some of the things that I loved about football myself and sports in general is well, so what I loved about the military, that camaraderie, that in it together piece that nothing else really matters except us in this moment. And, and that's something, you know, when you hang it up playing football um, or in the military, like, you're never going to have an opportunity like that. It's exactly like that, right? You can, yeah, you can play man. golf later in life. You can't go play football at our right. Age, right? Like, you could try. It, it, it's going to be a catch problem. a domestic um, violence charge real quick. Well, there's either yeah, either you're going to get hurt, or you're going to catch a case, or both, you know. And so it's not, you know, there's certain things that we just can't do anymore. In the military, same thing. That ship sailed. Yeah, um, man. You know, even though there's certain times where it's like, man, I wonder if I could still. No, it's not really the ship sailed, but business. That's what's fun. I think you know, for what I've seen and heard of you. And just our conversation today, like I know there's a direct correlation between being a competitor, wanting to win, wanting to to be the best and and, and, and whatever, like, and, and that's something within business and sales that every single day we can wake up and compete. Yeah, and that's how, when it comes to recruiting and trying to find really good competitive people that want to actually do the job the way that you're talking about, 
like, man, you can sell them on that opportunity of, look, you can go clock in and clock out down the road and make the same or more starting out with maybe better benefits. And maybe it's a little sexier role for your friends and family to talk to you about over Thanksgiving in the fall. But man, you're going to drive yourself nuts because in 10 years, you're gonna be doing the same thing, making the same amount of money just about, and you're going to hate your life. And, and so how can you wake up every single day doing something that you don't love to do, or at least get really excited about yeah. doing for, for whatever reason. And, and uh, that to me, that's just not a way to live. I don't, I think that one thing about the military is it's given me like a, a healthy understanding and even fear, or just um, recognizing that our, our time here on earth is, is limited, right? It's, it's finite. Ooh, take care and and so bank. why would you wake up and not do something to a, the fullest extent that you could possibly do it. And also preferably something that you love to do, and creating businesses, creating jobs, competing and winning is something that I get really excited about. Yeah, man. I don't have a, a ton of hobbies outside of stuff like we're talking about today and doing today. I'd rather spend my time with you than on the golf course, quite frankly, talking on, <laughs> on Zoom or whatever this platform is. Um, it's on and, all the major it, podcast apples, iTunes, you know. <laughs> there you go. Apple, iTunes, subscribe now. No, man, I, I love that. And you're right, dude. Like, once you're a competitor, you're a competitor. You know, like, I, I told my team, at, you know, it would it'd be so easy. We grew sixty percent last year. It'd be so easy just to be like, "Hey, man, let's just, you know, let's just take it, let's just take it easy, right?" It's like, "Nah, bro, I'm I'm ready to win another championship," you know. And whether you like Patrick Mahomes or not, uh, what that guy's talk about, right? He won his championship, and they're like, "Hey, how's it feel?" Blah blah. blah. He's like, "Oh, it's good," but like, this is just the start of the dynasty. Like, dude just won the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have any complacency, right? Like, if there was ever a time to have complacency, it would be after you win this. And the dude's like, nah, we're going to celebrate tonight, but, like, this is just the start of the dynasty. And 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 I think it it's just, you, you know, it's a different it's a different breed, and I think it's a, just a different different person, man, personality, makeups. But the, the competition, that's what I, I miss the most about football. I mean, obviously I miss hitting people, but you can't really do that anymore, uh, you know, without pads on. But uh, the the competitiveness, man, of going out and winning championships, and, like, that's what I tell my teams. Like, I, 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 want, a, I want a championship caliber team to go win championships with because, like, what what else are we doing here? Like, if it's not I'm, – I'm reading Bob Proctor's last book, uh, Change Your Paradigm, Change Your Life. I don't know if you've read that yet, but uh, he mm-hmm. just wrote it. It was kind of sad, man. He In the audio book, one of the clips, it's kind of like a series of interviews. He says, you know, I hope to be doing this for another 10 years, and he died that very next year after he put that Ooh. book out. And it's like, oh, damn, to, to be there cognitively, to be there, like having everything going on in your business and thinking you got another 10 years, I think that speaks to exactly what you're talking about. It's like, I mean, it's fleeting, bro. It could be gone tomorrow. And so it's like if I'm going to wake up and do something, I'm going to do something I'm passionate about with the people that I want to build with. Um, life is life is way too short to be complacent, mm-hmm. to, to put a bow yeah. on that. <laughs> No, you're spot on. You know, I mentioned my room has a lot of different things in it that you can't see, and you see Cobain behind me. But I also have a, a big portrait of Tupac, you know, across the way. And, and, okay. and the reason for that is because he packed so much, so much into the short life that he lived. You know, if you just look at the number of albums, the, at least the amount of music he put out to create albums after the fact, even and the movies, and the, I mean, an un- absurd a model of qualifications and success in a very limited amount of time. If you look at the years he was actually doing it, yeah. um, unbelievable. And, and so it's a cool reminder uh, of just, they, you have, you have more you can give yeah, and um, why not give it? You know, why not? And, and certain people like Patrick Mahomes, you know, he gets it. And a lot of people would watch an interview like that and say, why can't he just like chill and, and appreciate? And he probably does appreciate, but he also appreciates the journey that took him to get there. And so to him, it's not work. He's not waking up the next day, like upset. He has to wake up the next day to do whatever he was going to do towards the next championship. But, um, that's what, that's what he enjoys. And so sometimes it's like, you know, no one messes with you for going golfing or whatever right. you're into and not to throw shade at golf or whatever people do, but, um, but also don't throw shade at Patrick Mahomes or, or you or me for, doing what we love, which isn't necessarily golf, but the stuff like we're talking about today. Yeah. I always, I always say, be careful measuring your goals with another person's yardstick because 
a lot of times people go, whoa, why isn't he happy? He just, ow, he just won the Super Bowl. Well, fuck, dude, if your goal is to win 10 of those motherfuckers, one's not that big of a deal. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. And that's the problem is when people are like, well, he should be happy he won the Super Bowl. It's like, yeah, because your fat ass sits on the couch and eats potato chips all day and you couldn't imagine going to one single NFL practice. This guy's goal is to be bigger than Tom Brady. I, don't, I really truly believe just like – it was the two run plays in the Super Bowl. I don't know if you watched the Super Bowl or not, but the two times he ran for decent chunks of yardage, I'm like, that dude is playing to win this fucking Super Bowl today. Like, it, it literally, that was the thing where I seen because in the first half, bro, they were kind of scrambled. Like, I know a lot of guys are like hedge betting the under because, like, they took the over 40 and then, like, nobody scores points. And I, and I really think it is so important, if you're listening to this right now, do not measure your goals with someone else's yardstick. Somebody that could never be at Patrick Mahomes' level does not get to be the eco chamber to say like, oh God, you should just take your wins and be happy, right? Um, that's why like I, I used to, it used to kill me, man. I grew up in a small town, and when I started, you know, everybody was like rah rah DJ, go with your little landscaping business, and still I, until I put up a million, and then I put up two million. Well, then it was, well, DJ's the cocky, arrogant kid now. You know, it was like, well, what's he know? You know, he's so full of himself. And it's funny, people will root for you when your goals are below where they're at. And then once you surpass them, and not everybody, but a lot of the people, especially on the internet, we love all our trolls on Twitter, uh, the people on the internet, like, they love to kick the can out from underneath your feet, dude, and laugh and watch it make you fall. Um, I think it's it's big, it's... It's a very, very important that you believe in yourself when no one else does. That's the first step because you're going to hit adversity. Uh, you're going to hit adversity in business. You're going to hit adversity in anything you do, even if you take a job, if, even if you're not the entrepreneur. You're just being the salesperson. Or you want to be the next production manager at the company you're in. You're going to have adversity. I think the difference between champions and everybody else is how you handle that adversity. Yeah, I think there's some some real truth to that. I love what you said about the comparing the goals thing. And I think, you know, guys like you and I and as business owners and competitors, that, that also works in reverse too. We have to make sure we're remaining humble enough to acknowledge the fact that we might want to wake up and, and just attack the day every day. Yeah. But that the people that are wired like that, it's a small percentage of the population. And so, you know, we got to understand that too <laughs> so we don't drive ourselves crazy and drive everybody else crazy. But but when we're working with, I know you work with a lot of business owners on a lot of different, for a lot of reasons, coaching, yep. speaking, marketing, everything. And and so I think there's a balancing act to be had about like, it, it, with like recognizing where, the, what they're saying their goals are, but also trying to peel back the layers to make sure that what they're saying is actually true and accurate. And also they understand the impacts of what they're saying, right? So mm. example, um, an agent had most recently, not, not to me, said it to someone on my team that, you know what, like I get continuous recruiting, I get what he's saying, I get the message, I get the, but you know, what? I, I just, I just like being average. You know, I just like be, I, that was it. I just like being average middle of the pack, man. I'm good in the middle of the pack. Somebody and said this. I, someone said that not to me, but <laughs> someone on my team when they were like leaving the service and, and, um, I, and, and if the, if they're, if they believe that to be true and it is true, I am okay with that. I truly am. However, what they need to understand is when you sell, if you're a business owner and you're, you're content with average middle of the pack, you also have to understand what you're leaving on the table, right? So if you might make a hundred thousand a year, you might make a million a year, but if you're making a hundred thousand you could make a million, you just left 900,000 on the table. If you're making a million, it could be 10 million. You left $9 million on the table. And so, yeah, like if, if I just don't want someone to think that, like this is what I'm going to say because it's easy and I'm going to convince myself that that's normal, right? It, it, just like if, regardless of how fit someone is, for the most part, like if you could just push a button and be more fit, most people would push the button, mm. right? Like if you could have an eight pack from your six pack and you could push a button, you'd probably push the button. <laughs> and so don't say you don't want the eight pack, you don't want the six pack, you don't want the four pack. You just don't want to put in the work to get to the four pack. And it's easier to say, or the six pack or the eight, it's easier to say, I don't want that for myself. Ooh. Well, if you could push a button, you'd push the button. Yeah. So don't tell me you don't want that for yourself. And you're saying you're good with a hundred thousand. Okay. But if you could push a button and make it a million, you're telling me you wouldn't push the button. So it's not, you don't want a million. You just don't want to push all of the buttons that you have to push. Cause there's a lot of buttons you have to push. And it's a lot harder than just pushing a button. Yeah, that man, I like that. I like that. We we did a little cha-ching on that one too. You can take you guys can take that one to the bank. Because listen, I mean, it is it does come down to the fact that I I'm not for everybody, Al, and I have learned that, and I'm totally okay with that. Uh, you know, it's like, it's one of those things where, uh, and and I think 
oh, man, I just feel like we were lit. We're we're sliding down this slippery slope in this world where it's like, don't be offensive. And like, if you're too aggressive, you want to be too successful. Like you can offend somebody. I literally was on a call with a guy yesterday. He's an agent, and uh, you know, this is this will probably cringe and make turn some people off. But literally, like after 15 minutes, I was like, hey man, I gotta go. I gotta you know, I gotta hop on another call. He's like, well, don't rush me off the phone. I'm like. <laughs> the fuck you you think you're talking to first uh, I didn't say that I just kind of internalized that a little bit I was like hey man you scheduled a 15 minute call I got another call right behind this I I gotta run and he was like well I just I I think your price I think your pricing's a little a little high would you get would you offer a discount and I was like dude I no, and I don't have time to get into that we don't offer discounts like the pricing is what it is and he said well maybe I'll just find somebody else to work with like trying to like like pull pull that and, and I said actually I think that would be the best move. After our 15-minute conversation, I think it would be best if you worked with someone else. And then he started, like, backpedaling. Well, I didn't mean I was going to work with somebody else, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like I, I think being being authentically yourself is one of the best things you can do for the world and for everybody else around you because being authentically yourself means that I can make a real judgment call on – if I want to deal with you or not, if I want to hang out with you, if I want to do business with you, if I want to be friends, if I want to talk goals with you. I, what bothers me more than anything is people that switch. They get one environment and they're one person. They get another environment and they're another person. Like I think one of the best things you can do is be authentically yourself 24-7. And, dude, just let the chips fall. But that is so hard, and Al, I'd love your take on this, that's so hard to do if you have a scarcity mindset. Because I think a lot of people, especially if you're in a sales role or a business owner, if you have a scarcity mindset, you're afraid to offend somebody because you're like, well, that could be a potential customer. Dude, if you live in abundance and know that the universe is going to deliver all the customers you could ever need to provide all the service that you could ever provide, you got nothing to worry about. Bob Proctor talked to me about this as I was getting ready to say. He said that you don't work for money. You work for pleasure and you provide service for money. So if you're waking up and going to work every day just to work for money, you're doing it wrong, man. you got to work for what makes you happy and provide a service. You render a service to get paid. Um, talk to me a little bit about that. I'll volley it back over to you, man. Yeah, so going back to your comment around scarcity, I think that sometimes you can do addition by subtraction when it comes to, to clients and, and customers, right? Yep. There's love that saying. You know, you, uh, customers aren't all treat aren't all equal as far as uh, you know what you have to. And same thing, whether it's insurance customers or marketing customers or recruiting customers. Yep. You know, if someone takes ten times the amount of of time and energy from you or your team, and pays the same amount as the the person down the way. Like it would make sense to not have that person as a customer anymore. Right. Right. Or if there's a way to charge differently, like some like, <laughs> Hey, you're paying the ass like premium. Um, so be it. But sometimes you have to, and again, the best thing you can do is exactly what you did in this case where you kind of head that off before they become customers and just yeah. have a real honest conversation around where you see them. And, and I've had comparable conversations over the years, but one thing that you ran into that I've ran into is typically the more, authentic, like your point, the more authentic I am, the more honest I am about what I'm looking for, what I'm not looking for, what really bothers me. Um, it's, it's like the more they want to join, the more they want to be a part of it. Cause it's like, they can, they can, they can tell if you're being real or just yeah. selling. Like I could, I could tell you everything you want to hear and tell you, oh, this is going to fix your problems immediately. And it's going to guarantee you this, that, and the other and blah, blah, blah. But it, at the end of the day, that's not true. And, and so by saying, oh, by the way, these are things that piss off customers that don't understand what we do. Like this annoys people, this annoys people, this annoys people. And then, oh, by the way, here's a list of things that annoy me. Yeah. This annoys me, this annoys me, this annoys me. And then say, look, if you're cool with all that that we just talked about, like, I'd love to have you. If not, like, totally cool. I can refer you out to some other recruiting businesses that are probably more in line with what you're looking for or what you're wanting. <laughs> the same thing with insurance customers. It's like, you know, I've had, you know, friends, quite frankly, um, you know, reach out this is years ago, like, Hey, I want to, I want life insurance. Cool. Let's talk. And then they, you know, they ask for some prices you get, you know, okay, well, if it was, this is that, and here's the price. All right, cool. I'm going to go, you know, running around by my, my other guy and this guy and that gal, whatever. And I'll let you know, you know, my response in those situations is, Hey, you know what? Don't worry about it. I don't, I don't, I don't play that game with life insurance. That's just not uh, this type of product, this type of thing we're talking about, this isn't a, it's, it's compare prices kind of a thing. This is a big deal. So, um, no, we're, we're good. You, you go ahead and take care of business, but, uh, and that's okay. 
I That's like okay. that, man. You know, I, I'll give this to the listeners. You guys can write this down. It's an acronym I use all the time when I'm training people. It's STUD, S-T-U-D. stands for Specific Next Step, Takeaway, Urgency, and Deadline. That is how you become a sales stud, is in every interaction, you should always have a specific next step, right? You get off the call, the number of salespeople that I coach that I see them go, all right, man, well, uh, I'll send the proposal over and, uh, you know, I'll follow up with you in a couple weeks. It's like, dude, you're just leaving the door open. Nail it down. Hey, <laughs> uh, what we have found is that within 72 hours, you have enough time to make a value-based decision. How about I follow up with you in three days? Does that sound fair, Alex? Right? Boom. Nail it down. Specific next step. Takeaway. The, the takeaway. It's like I told the guys, like, hey, I don't think I don't think we're a good fit, right? A lot of times that takeaway, they're like, no, 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 I'm cool. I'm, I'll be fine. I'll get in line. You know, I'll, I'll work with you guys. The urgency piece and then the deadline. Are, are, I always, uh, again, the podcast, I, you know, it's very easy to, a lot of podcasts these days are very surface level. Like, oh, Alex, tell us your background. Yeah, it's okay. Well, tell us about your recruiting business. Oh, tell us about your insurance business. Like, fuck that, dude. Like, I, I like to get to the nuts and bolts. And I think that's why people like to listen to the podcast. So I always like to give them little gold nuggets that they can take away. Talk to me about the recruiting piece, man. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about um, the challenges because I'm, I'm a big fan. Uh, I had a 72-year-old mentor when I was a high school senior and started my first business. By the time my chemistry teacher, my guidance counselor, tried to talk me out of it and didn't help me, I said, fuck it, I'm going to go find my own mentor that's going to encourage me. So it happened to be the 72-year-old guy that ran the, the Chevy dealership. He's, he's gone now, um, Herb Kinman, um, RIP. But uh, he told me that, um, he said, DJ, when, when you're, you're finding people, when you're, when you're recruiting people to be on your team, you got to make sure that you're all going to the same place. You're all going to the same place. And when I hear business owners, Alex, a lot of times they say, oh, man, it's, you know, oh, it's hard to find good people, right? So it's hard to find, you know, good help doesn't stick around, blah, 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 right? A lot of times I'm like, yeah, maybe you should look in the mirror first. Uh, but then it's like, are, are you going to the same place? Talk to me about, like, when you guys are recruiting, some of the pitfalls that you see, because um, that's always something that stuck with me is, it, are, am I going to the same place as my team's going? But, like, what are some of the pitfalls that you see? Because obviously with working with over 1,000 clients, You've got quite the case study uh, to look at as far as uh, commonalities. Sure, I think the the biggest the I think the the biggest hurdle that I see small business owners making in multiple industries across the country, multiple different sizes, multiple different markets, is especially and I know I'll, I'll focus on insurance right now in particular, but this is beyond insurance thinking that there needs to be a lot of different boxes to check before getting in front of and interviewing people. And so as business owners, we oftentimes, everybody has their own thing that they want and need in their mind. And they have an idea of what it looks like and sounds like and what degrees they have or whatever. And they start to really narrow their focus and, and recruiting is no different than selling. It, it's sales. It's a numbers game. And so when we start to talk about do we want to focus on quality or, or quantity of interviews? It's extremely difficult for us to determine what exactly does quality look and sound like early on in the recruiting process. And so for that reason, my message for the vast majority of small business owners is let's focus on quantity of interviews, not just the quality piece. So quick math, right? So if, if an insurance agent says, I want to hire a salesperson. Okay, cool. All right. Well now, and I'll give you a real life example. Someone uh, in the great state of Ohio, uh, <laughs> I'm from Michigan. So I use that term a little loosely. I have family down there so I can joke around about it. But anyway, um, insurance agent in Ohio, uh, disappointed in the service. And as I investigate, turns out she wouldn't interview anybody unless, unless the person had uh, sales experience, and uh, an insurance license and bilingual before she'd even interview somebody, let alone hire somebody. So let's think about the, the population of Ohio. And we'll just focus on like <laughs> bilingual first. How, what percentage of the population is bilingual? It, 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 rounding up by a lot, let's say 20, 20%. <laughs> yeah, I was going right? to say and five then, to okay, 10, maybe. <laughs> well, yeah, probably less than that. But like, just say 20% for simple math. All right, what percentage of population is insurance licensed. If you round to the nearest percent, it's 0%, but let's round up to 1%, right? But let's actually, let's round up to 5% to make it really in their favor. 
So you take the 20% and the 5% of the 20%, you're, you're leaving us with a pool of candidates of 1% of the population. And so you're comparing what we do for your peers that give us 100% of the population to the, the pool of candidates that you've left for us, which is less than 1% of the population, and you're expecting a, a comparable result. Wow. And that's not fair. Yeah. And so regardless of what business or industry you're in, you want to think about what are those things that you want that you really don't need to get in front of people to see, can this person have a great conversation? Are they likable? Do they have a great personality? Are they coachable? Are they hardworking? Are they cut from that cloth that we talked about earlier? And chances are you weren't going to determine that with a couple little assessments and a little phone screen on the resume or whatever. So <laughs> like step up to the plate and interview people, increase the volume of interviews, go for quant quantity, not qu quality, quantity. You, you go for quantity of interviews and quality of hire after the fact, Yeah, not in reverse. Right. So um, that to me, like if there was one little nugget of, as far as recruiting goes, like think about what you've been holding out for and then look at yourself in the mirror when you got started and would you have even hired yourself? I think I've heard you say that at uh, one of the Five Guys events. I think you did. Like you had, to, did you do? You had everybody stand up. I think don't you have, like have everybody? <laughs> yeah, because it was like everybody stand up. Okay, now sit down if you're like this or that or this or that. And it was like you know out of the whole room of insurance fucking people. Like like these are like mm -hmm. everybody. There's like one, maybe maybe two, yeah. right? Like it's like it goes to show you. Alex paints a really good picture. Uh, which by the way, man, uh, from your professional speaker to another professional speaker like your engagement with the audience like that's a lot of people don't realize that's what makes a great speaker is like if you're engaging with the audience you have them do those things so like that that stood out to me i was in the back of the room i was like oh, i see him i see him working a crowd uh, that. <laughs> so that was good no man i and i i can appreciate that i've always uh heard this saying and i'm curious your thoughts on this is hire the will teach the skill Cause it's like you yeah. can you can teach people skill. Like I mean, I don't know necessarily you want to go teach somebody to be bilingual, but maybe that's something that you could hang up on. But for the most part, it's like if I find a kid that's just got work ethic, right? And I'm I'm working on this right now with Kevin Span. He's a a big Allstate agent up in New York, and he wants to get more people in the insurance business because he's like you know guidance counselors don't set you down your junior year and go, well, Alex. Um, you, you, your GPA is this, and these are your classes, these are your electives. You're a prime candidate to be an insurance agent. Have you ever considered that career path? Like, that's never, you know, and to your point earlier, you're like, you know, I'm going to put you in this job that maybe is like your team's like, your family's like, oh, you're in insurance. But it's like, there, it's crazy that these jobs, like, like an insurance agent, is not something it's like, oh, well, what went wrong in your life, right? It's like, you know, why why'd you end up as an insurance agent? But it's such a great career uh, yeah. that, that people overlook. It's fun. One of my good friends, Nathan Shanks, in Louisville, he's an independent agent. He said, dude, I knew I wanted to be an insurance agent. I was like, what? No, nobody's like in high school know they want to be. He said, no, 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 I knew because I worked at the country club cleaning golf carts. <laughs> and, and when the guys came through, I'd say, what do you do for a living? Check. What do you do for a living? Check. And he said, and at the end of the first week, dude, it was over-indexed for insurance agents. He's like, I knew that I wanted to be an insurance agent because he wants to play golf all the time. So it's That's uh, smart. it's kind of crazy. Brilliant. Yeah. That's hilarious. <laughs> cool, man. I know I know we're bouncing all over the place. We got we got a, uh, maybe a couple more minutes. We'll wrap it up. I do want to talk about your other book you got back there. Is it uh, Big big Recruiting? It's hard for me to see because it's a little far yeah, back. Maybe you got a couple. Uh, small, small Business, Big Recruiting. Okay. So. There it is up close. Beautiful. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. And I'm guessing that's about uh, planting gardens, right? No, it's, it's recruiting, right? Talk to us about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah pretty <laughs> much. So this book, you know, and some will say, well, didn't you have a business that recruits for people? Yes, but this will still, kind of, whether you're with us or not, this will help you as a small business owner really win the talent war we've been struggling with for a very long time, you know, and that's my mission really with recruiting is to put us in a position to win so we can compete with the big dogs that we've been losing to for a very, very long time. And, uh, and so you're just going to, it's an easy read. I mean, it, it's one of those that you could probably sit down and read in a couple of days. Um, and you're going to get a lot of little takeaways that will make you a better recruiter. So if you are going to remain doing this yourself and wearing that recruiter hat yourself, so be it, at least do it at a high level. And this is going to help you do that. Very cool, man. That's, they can get that at autopilotrecruiting.com. Yeah. Autopilotrecruiting.com. And I do know this one is for sure on Amazon still. Very cool. Very cool, man. What's something that we didn't talk about that you wanted to talk about? Oh, man, that's uh Or maybe a question I didn't well, ask you that you think I should ask you. 
um, gosh dang, you know, I, I told my wife I was doing this podcast and she's like, what are you guys going to talk about? I'm like, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I kind of like it that way. You know, I don't like to pre-plan stuff. I usually just comes out better if I'm just winging it. Uh, and so, yeah, um, for that reason, I, I'm, I'm struggling to answer that question. Of what, <laughs> what question should you be asking me right now? But, um, I call it creative, giving yourself creative space. Some people call it winging it, but I say, I give myself creative space to explore. Cause I want to be able to, you know, I want to be able to mm-hmm. go down, uh, and, and have conversations like we did today, but I don't know, man. Maybe, yeah, you know, I don't, I mean, I, I really love the conversation around just being an entrepreneur, being a business owner, competing. I, I do feel, you know, you made the correlation again between football and military and, and business. And, you know, we look at, you know, look at the military and, and most would agree that's a very noble profession. Absolutely. And I think insurance sales is a very noble profession for a lot of reasons. But I, I think that, man, like outside of, you could throw obviously like nurses and teachers and uh, police officers and firefighters, all of that mix. But as an entrepreneur, as a business owner that creates jobs for people, like I don't know what, man, there's very few things that are as patriotic, in my opinion, than creating jobs in the United Ooh. States. Uh, good, <laughs> fair, um, you know, opportunities for, for families that were non existent before. And, and so I really get excited. It, that motivates me. I, I love my people. Now, you mentioned looking in the mirror earlier, you were alluding to leadership is what you were talking about. So when you have issues with team and turnover and, and failed hires or improper onboarding, a lot of it comes down to leadership. And and so that that's what motivates me. Like I like money, not going to lie, but you know, to me, I love to compete and I love to give opportunities to people. And so I'm looking forward to continuously creating jobs, creating more businesses in the future. And, um, you know, if, if the zeros start to stack up for me, that's cool. But honestly, like what, what motivates me and drives me are the people that, that I get to, to, to include in that, that journey with me. That's cool, man. I think, and, and I know just from our in-person, uh, conversations that we've had meeting you in person, you're just a real cat. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I, I know that that's genuine. Uh, it's easy for a lot of people to like, Oh yeah, I just want to like build big teams to build people. It's like, uh, it's like, that's not a talking point for you. Uh, I know that it's a, it's, it's, a, it's something that matters to you. Um, and, and I think coming here and spending an hour with my audience and, helping them understand uh, some things around recruiting and your your mindset around business. Um, I know they very much appreciate it as well, man. So um, if anybody wants to find you on social, obviously we plugged autopilotrecruiting.com. You guys can go there. Um, how do they find you on social media? Are you doing anything with, with social media? I know uh, you got a team that helps you out pump, pump, pump out some content there. Yeah, I mean, Autopilot's on Instagram and Facebook. Myself, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, um, LinkedIn. And if you search Alex Shattuck, you, you'll you'll find me S H A T T U C K. I'm not too hard to find. <laughs> Very cool, man. Well, I appreciate you coming into Sales Factory, Alex. It's uh, it's been it's been cool, man. Time flew by. It's always it always flies when you're having fun. We definitely look forward to having you in a uh, in another episode. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Absolutely, guys. Well, hey, uh, as we head out of this episode in the Sales Factory, make sure you guys hit that subscribe button. Leave us a review. Helps more people find the podcast. We can change it one life at a time, baby. I'm your host, Coach Carroll. This has been another episode of the Sales Factory. Hustle is worth it, baby. Let's go. Let's go.